All right, uh, thanks Jeff and thanks to Steve um, and others for the invitation to be here and thank you all for, for attending. Um, so I wanna talk about climate risk and uh, let you know kind of what I mean by climate risk. And uh, you know, I think that, that the climate, climate research community is at the cusp now in terms of, of big data between a uh, past in which uh, climate has climate research has really been um, very accustomed to large large data sets uh, and and uh, large computational resources uh, in terms of petabytes and petaflops, um, but in in uh, very sort of structured uh, structured data sets. So that being the past where we could always used to say, oh, big data, yeah, well, you know, we have. We have big data sets. Here's our here's our uh, terabytes and petabytes, and and now uh, on the other hand, you know, looking forward, we're really not. I think we're we're now we're now at the point where we're well behind really the you know this this emerging cutting edge of big data in terms of of uh, integrating all of the unstructured um, new kinds of data that are that are available. So, um, I, what I'd like to do is. Um, Talk a bit about climate change and why it's a big challenge and why climate risk uh, is is a risk, and and what shapes those risks, and then uh, provide some thoughts about uh, this question whether or not whether or not big data can can help us. All right, so I really have four four messages uh, about climate change. One is that that global warming has already increased the risk of high impact climate events, and that. Going forward, uh, the risks of further change and further impacts are are much greater if we continue along a business as usual pathway in terms of um, carbon intensity of energy, uh, global emissions, and global warming, compared with a world in which the United Nations targets uh, are are met and and global warming is constrained. However, there's a big challenge because uh, really. Climate change is a side effect of the benefits of energy consumption, and I, I get tremendous benefits from energy consumption. Um, the, you know, the the world worldwide, we get get tremendous benefits, uh, but there's a big gap in access to energy resources, and most people uh, in the world have much less access than I do, and and billions of people really are in are in a state of energy poverty, and this is this is the real challenge um, that creates creates momentum towards higher levels of warming. And um, just because I usually get told that I'm a big downer, um, I have the word hope here. So the word hope will come up, uh, come up in a couple of places. So I do think there's hope. I just want to be out front. I do think there's hope, and I think that actually we have, we have the um, ability to be a real engine for for innovating uh, the the solutions that are going to be needed to to both ensure access to the benefits of energy consumption to all people on planet Earth while um, Minimizing minimizing climate change, um, if you want to put it another way, maintaining something like the the climate uh, that we're accustomed to, and I think that there's a potentially a big role for for big data, and I'll, I'll come back to these for towards the end, um, and and these kind of highlight both where where climate research has been and, and and where climate research isn't yet, but but I think could be. So certainly, you know, in terms of in terms of climate. Um, Climate modeling, weather modeling, uh, analysis, uh, you know, huge computational resources have been devoted in this area, uh, certainly the United States and, and Japan and Europe. Um, so, I mean, just as one example, the, the, uh, one, of the, one of the most recent uh, large clusters at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which at one point was the, was the fastest, um, fastest computer on the, you know, the top, top 500 charts, about 35% of that computer was going to climate modeling. So, I mean, this is a big, in terms of um, computational demand, it's, it's big, it produces a lot of data, but again, it's very, it's very structured. Um, and again, as I, as I alluded to, I think that there are, there's, there's potential for um, further innovation in, in, in terms of data assimilation, um, particularly with emerging sensors, and then also kind of non-climate non -climate data uh, such as we're, we're seeing from social and search and geolocation, I think there's real potential to understand climate risks uh, from those data sources. All right, so global warming is occurring. Uh, it's an observation. This is the, let me make sure I press the right 
button here to make sure I get the pointer. All right, I got lucky. Um, so this is the this is the global temperature record. It's expressed as an anomaly from a baseline. So each year is is up or down from that just that baseline mean temperature. And uh, you we're going from 1850 on the left up to uh, the present day on the right, and you can see a lot of up and down. There's variability from year to year. There's there's variability from decade to decade, uh, but uh, there unequivocally. Uh, this noisy series is tilted on a trend. That trend is global warming. Um, so global warming is happening. It's an observation. Um, you know, in terms of signal to noise ratio, the it's like the Higgs boson. Um, when that was when when Higgs boson news was coming out, we heard a lot about this five to one signal to noise ratio. If any of you have seen the video of um, how many of you seen the video of the Stanford physics professor uh, who was Prediction he made about the Big Bang, with, you know, some few decades ago, just just was confirmed. Uh, if you watch that video online, um, it's it's been viewed a few million times. But if you go see it, when it's there's a, a assistant professor here at Stanford knocking on on the senior professor's door, and the door opens, and just about the first thing the assistant professor says is, "It's five to one." Right? I mean, this, so this five to one signal noise ratio is big. Um, you know, it, it's very high likelihood to be not noise. And if we look at the pattern of warming in the troposphere, the part of the atmosphere where we live, that signal noise ratio is about seven to one. And if we look at the stratospheric warming, it's about 30 to one. So this is not, the, the signal noise um, in terms of the observations is really unequivocal. This is, we, we, have, we have global warming. Um, and you know, we, we face a lot of risk in, from, from stresses in the climate system and, and uh, we, we face them now from the climate system that we have, and we're facing uh, changes in, in risk as, as global warming occurs. So this is, this is uh, a conceptual uh, diagram of, of the sources of risk. And really, the risk that we face in the climate system is the intersection of the physical hazard, uh, which you see on the darkest blue. Uh, so that's you know, heat waves and, and thunderstorms and um, extreme storm surges and, and uh, those kinds of hazards. Uh, the, the second dimension is exposure, and this is really the you know what what's in harm's way. Uh, so if you know if there's a if a tree falls in the woods and there's no one to hear it, did it make a sound? If there's a tornado in the Great Plains and no one's there to get struck by it, what's the risk? Right, the risk is is not just the tornado; it's also what's exposed. So this could be people, uh, infrastructure, ecosystems, um, and then the third dimension is the vulnerability. So how how vulnerable are those those assets? Um, and, and not all not all assets are, are equally vulnerable, and uh, the, the the intersection of these three dimensions is what creates climate risks, and, and we are seeing evolving risks at present. Um, just you know, in, in the U.S., we we again we experience you know, we we know we're not optimized for the climate system that we have now. Right? So we've uh, more than seventy billion dollar weather and climate disasters in the last decade. Right? So we're not. We're not optimized um, to the current climate, and we are uh, we're experiencing a changing climate. And we know from observations that the likelihood of many kinds of extremes has already changed. We see this with severe heat. Uh, we see it with heavy rainfall. We see it with uh, extreme storm surge flooding. Uh, a couple of examples: um, work that we've done in in my lab has uh, you know the quantification that we've done suggests that the severe heat that occurred in um, the Midwest and Northeast in the summer of 2012, when this picture was taken, um, huge huge impacts on crop yields that went all the way through uh, into food prices. Um, our quantification is that the the that level of severe heat is about four times more likely in the current climate than without the global warming that's already been observed. So again, increasing risk of of high impact events. Similar work uh, by others analyzing the storm surge that occurred during Sandy in New York has uh, suggested that the sea level rise that's already occurred almost doubled the likelihood of that level, that Sandy level of flooding uh, in at Battery Park. Um, just for exactly the same storm, but just the, the sea level rise has, has doubled the risk of extreme flooding. So we're already seeing, just in that hazard dimension, uh, never mind vulnerability and exposure, which are you know, moving in different directions in different areas. Just from the hazard perspective of hazard, uh, that we're, we're seeing increased risk already. Uh, we also know that um, that 
the global warming that we've observed is due primarily to the emission of greenhouse gases from human activities, uh, particularly carbon dioxide emissions. And uh, here in the, uh, the black dots, each of these, um, each black dot is the fossil fuel CO2 emissions in a given year. And if we look back historically, um, since the start of the industrial age, about a quarter of the emissions have been from the United States, about a quarter have been from Europe. And uh, what we're seeing in recent years is uh, not only increasing total emissions in each year, but an acceleration in the rate of increasing the rate of emissions. Um, and the annual emissions have about doubled uh, over the last 25 years. And uh, we know from the from just the energy balance of the of the planet, the basic physics of of energy input and output, um, that if if the world continues along this business as usual pathway, we're likely to see about four degrees of global warming relative to the pre-industrial, and that's about twice the level of warming that's been identified by the United Nations, uh, which has a two degree warming target and the international community is, you know, is moving forward with binding commitments um, to achieve that two degree target. That's not a prediction. I'm not making a prediction of whether or not they will, uh, they will achieve that two degree target, but that's the, that's the, the position of international negotiations. Um, now, achieving that two degree target is really going to require, um, just in terms of the basic arithmetic of, of, of uh, how temperature responds to, to CO2 in the atmosphere, achieving the two degree target is, you know, given that we've already, we're already almost at one degree, is really gonna require um, a real change in the global pathway of emissions. And that's not, I'm not arguing that that has to happen. I'm simply declaring that based on the arithmetic, you, we, we, the, the pathway to two degrees is a different pathway than what, what is currently empirically seen in the real world. Um, but it is possible. It is the window is the window remains open. Um, but what I what I want to give you a few examples of now is the difference between this four degree world, as you'll hear me call it, uh, that's basically this business as usual, the trajectory we're on, and the two degree world that that the UN has identified. And so one example is is hot extremes, and uh, we experience a lot of stress uh, year to year around the world from hot extremes and. Uh, what I'm showing you are, are two maps here, one for the four degree world and one for the two degree world. And what we've done is we've looked at each, um, each area of the globe and we've looked back at the late 20th century, at the recent past, and we've asked what was the hottest season that occurred in each area uh, during that, that recent historical period. And then we've looked out using, using a large suite of climate models, again, this you know, big data in terms of um, these climate model experiments. Um, so in in total, those you know, it's about three petabytes of data, although um, that's for the more than just the temperature field. But uh, we're analyzing so we're analyzing a large a large climate model experiment, um, and we're just asking how often does that hottest temperature from the from the recent historical period how often does it occur in each of these worlds the four degree world and the two degree world, and you can see on the right in the four degree world it's pretty much all dark red, so. Uh, 80, 90, 100 percent of the years exceeding what used to be the hottest uh, season, that uh, the risk of, of intensification of extreme heat is substantially reduced in the two degree world. Uh, similarly, for extremely low snow years, so here in, in uh, California, about 30 percent of our water resources are dependent on Sierra snowpack, and this is generally true in, in the western United States and western North America that our, our water resources are, are heavily dependent on um, on uh, the snowpack, and uh, we're in the midst of an extremely low snow year, as was pointed out by Governor Brown, right there, it's pointing. Um, and I'm uh, just going to show you an animation that's a very similar calculation to what I just showed you for temperature, but in this case, it's the, the percentage of years that are below what used to be the lowest spring snowpack, and you can see that um, I'll just replay the animation if I can. All right. Um, so out by the time, by the end of this business as usual pathway, uh, depending on where you're looking in the in Western North America, somewhere between 40 and 80 percent of years uh, fall below the level that used to be the lowest level. So this is when 
uh, when you hear a new normal, this is what people are talking about. It's literally statistically a, a new normal where what used to be extreme becomes common. Um, so there are some other other examples. Um, I'll just show one really quick. Another example from our from our group uh, looking at premium wine grape uh, suitability in in the Western United States. When we look out over the next three decades, again using a suite of of climate model simulations, um, because uh, wine grapes have a relatively narrow uh, climate uh, tolerance, what we see is that. Uh, the, the global warming and the regional warming that's associated with that ends up really restricting the area in, in a number of the, the high value growing regions. Uh, Napa, for example, greater than 40% reduction over the next three decades. Um, and that's in, that's in the area that's, that falls in what's the current suitability. So these are, um, these are the kinds of impacts that, uh, that we're facing, the kinds of risks that we're facing. Uh, we see it with, again, with severe heat and snow, also uh, in the literature, heavy precipitation extreme storm surge flooding, um, likely increases in the volatility of crop yields and, and as a result uh, crop prices, changes in the location of um, suitable climate uh, not only for crops but also for, for uh, natural ecosystems. Uh, and we see this not only, in, um, not only in, in managed systems but also on land but also in, in coastal ocean habitats. Um, and part of why this is a a big challenge uh, is really that we're we're the 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 rate of change in this four degree world. You know, four degrees of global warming in a century, and the associated regional and local climate changes that come with that are unprecedented in uh, the last 65 million years uh, since since the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. And we know already that uh, the the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is higher than it's been in the last 800,000 years. Um, looking back at geologic proxies, uh, we know that, that for most of the last 20 million years, carbon dioxide concentrations were below the level that they are now, 400 parts per million. Um, and if we, uh, again, if we look at the geologic record of, of global scale climate transitions, what we're, what we're facing in, in uh, this business as usual uh, world and really even in two degrees, two degrees of warming in a century is really uh, substantially faster for global scale change than what uh, the world has, has seen in the recent geologic past. Um, so uh, there's a lot of inertia towards, towards further climate change um, given, given our current energy system, our current energy economy, again, the tremendous benefits that I get from consuming energy. And there are a lot of a lot of sources of inertia, uh, but the one I want to focus on for just a couple minutes is human well-being. And this has come up a number of times today because um, we climate change is a side effect of of the benefits of energy consumption. There's no, um, you know, it's it's whether whether uh, without being normative, it's not. Um, you know, no one's no one's as far as I know, no one's trying to alter the climate. It's just you know, people are people are trying to to improve their well-being and and and. Uh, Carbon, fossil fuel, carbon-based energy sources are, are uh, confer tremendous benefits. And um, I have this picture up here. Uh, th these are these are college students uh, in Guinea, um, and this is the airport, and they're all lined up, uh, each on a bollard at the airport, underneath the lights outside in the in the outside the airport, uh, studying. Uh, their their homes don't have electricity. They have to literally migrate to the airport to, to study. So the most fundamental um, kind of drive to improve human well-being is education. Uh, it requires, requires energy and, and um, large populations lack access to that, to those benefits. And we see that, um, we see that with, with lack of access to clean water, uh, lack of access to clean um, cooking fuels, electricity, as I've mentioned, transportation. And in fact, the lack of energy access um, actually creates tremendous vulnerability to climate stresses. Um, and so, one of the one of the paradoxes of um, of climate is and climate change is that you know, for billions of people in the world, uh, it could actually decrease their vulnerability vulnerability to climate stresses by increasing their energy consumption. And in the current energy system, that means emitting more greenhouse gases and creating further climate change. Um, 
So that's really the, that's really the challenge. Is um, you know if we look at all the countries in the world, uh, each of these are a dot. The horizontal axis is um, is uh, the per capita energy consumption. The vertical axis is the is the human development index, and you know these. The, all the countries that are above 0 0.9, there's 28 countries that are above this, you know, in this top, um, top uh, 0 0.9 and above, is 15% of the global population and 85% of the global CO2 emissions. And so the real question is, how is what, what's the energy mix that's going to enable the human development of, of this other 85% you know, uh, of the global population? And if that looks something like me, like my energy consumption, then that's the equivalent of adding 15 United States to the global emissions total. And that gives us a more than a 50% probability of exceeding the four degree target or four degree, the four degree level of global warming. Um, it doesn't have to be the US. I, I picked the US first because that's that's me. That's what I look like. Um, there are other countries that have a, you know, that still have a high level of human development, have a lower, lower uh, level of energy consumption, um, and maybe a maybe a less carbon intensive fuel mix. But even something like Japan still gives uh, more than a 90% probability of exceeding the two-degree target. So uh, the real challenge is how can we, um, again, both ensure the um, ensure the well-being that requires energy uh, while while also limiting global warming. And uh, this is where I think we can we in the Bay Area and and in the U.S. Uh, can really be be the engine of innovation in. Uh, figuring out the energy technologies, the behavioral technologies, which we've heard a lot about today already, um, infrastructure design, a whole suite of, of areas where, you know, we don't have an example of a country in the world where we can say, if everybody just looked like that, then we'd solve this this problem. Um, we need we need innovation. And so, um, just the last, I want to come back to the big data here right at the end. And I think that there are there's tremendous potential in um, in each of these areas for for innovation, uh, certainly we're you know the the, uh, the the first of these is you know in many ways is a um, you know has been a access to computational resources question, but at this point I think we're actually lagging behind intellectually um, in that we're not you know we heard about GPUs earlier today we're not the climate community isn't really taking advantage of those yet and other other sort of so there there is potential to take the lid off um, just on the computational availability. I think there are a lot of ways we can improve our analysis of these these massive climate data sets, um, and then the, just the last thing I want to mention really quick um, is what you know something that I don't I don't know the answer to, but I think in terms of this risk framing, uh, we have a lot of opportunities to understand um, exposure and vulnerability through these through these new unstructured data streams. And just one um, one example really quick here is of something that's just um, you know, it's really new, not actually not even published yet. Um, I found this on the internet. Um, I was not involved in this work, but you know, in this case, uh, similar as we saw this morning with the tweets during the during the earthquakes, this is analysis of of tweets during Hurricane Sandy, and uh, you know, this is a this is a um, there are a number of, of you know, big data um, big data challenges here. Uh, in this case, they're trying to correlate the tweets with the location of the hurricane and the forecast, the hurricane forecast through time. Um, this is a this is a short-term application of this kind of um, new social network sensor integration into into climate weather research. I think where there's real potential is to look over the long term uh, and try to understand vulnerability and exposure uh, using these using these new data streams. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention.